I believe that Paul's pretty strong at times against the strong in their arrogance, and he is pushing really hard for the strong to use their positions for the sake of the weak. So I think it was Kathy Ahrensperger who talked about power over, uh, power with, and power for. Definitely, Paul believes that in power for. They have the status, they have the powerful position, but they need to use that for the sake of others. Welcome to Theology Curator, a podcast hosted by Kurt Willems and available online at theologycurator.com. Each episode looks at a theological, formational, or cultural theme. We might dig into the life and letters of a radical Jewish teacher named Paul, converse about a pressing contemporary issue, reflect on the nature of following Jesus today, or even attempt to remedy doom and gloom preaching with a good old-fashioned dose of hope. This show is an invitation to build bridges between the first century world of the earliest Christ followers into the 21st century reality we now inhabit. The Jesus we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. Welcome back, my friends. This is Kurt Willems. Excited to have you with me on Theology Curator. This is a podcast where we explore ideas from biblical studies. We look at spiritual formation themes, things having to do with church and Christianity in North America, and pretty much anything that has to do with Jesus. And so I'm happy that you've joined me today. And right now, we get to step into a great conversation with Scott McKnight. Now, Scott's a friend who has been encouraging and so just helpful on my journey through his writing, through his blogging, through his um, just voice. I just really appreciate him on all kinds of levels. And so I believe this is the third time that Scott's been on the show, which is great. He was on it kind of as a general voice for talking through some issues about Paul, back when this was solely the Paul cast. He also talked to us about a commentary he wrote on Philemon. And so we've we've had some great conversation. And today we're going to talk about Romans. He had a book come out in the last several months called Reading Romans Backwards, A Gospel of Peace in the Midst of Empire. And friends, it is really good stuff. The core of the book is what really resonates in a lot of ways, talking about the powerful versus the powerless, talking about privilege. And as a guy who has been on this journey to discover what my own privilege is as a white man in North America, middle class, et cetera, I've, I've had to wrestle with lots of identity stuff. And here, Scott McKnight, also white male North America, you know, privileged guy as well, is saying, hey, those of us with privilege need to pay extra attention to Romans because it is inviting us who have privilege to utilize privilege for the sake of those who don't and to come alongside and to be in relationship with. And there's this quote that I want to just sort of orient us towards. I didn't mention it during the interview itself, but I love this quote. It's kind of a summation of the the whole thing that Scott's trying to do here. It says, quote, the operative terms for Paul are welcome one another to the table as siblings. The whole letter is found in that imperative. Friends, get ready for a good one. I am so excited to talk with Scott McKnight and to share these insights with you. I am sitting across the internet from Scott McKnight, and we are going to be talking about a book called Reading Romans Backwards, A Gospel of Peace in the Midst of Empire. Scott, always great to chat with you. How are you doing? Doing well, Kurt. Good to talk with you and glad to be back on your podcast. Oh, yeah, I know. I've uh, it's, been, it's been a while since that last conversation, so I'm excited. We've got this one and hopefully another one coming up in the near future, too. So, um you know, it's uh, it's exciting for me to always have these kind of conversations about Paul, about the Bible. Um, and a lot of people have probably heard other interviews we've done or have heard of you. But if you don't mind, can you give us the bit of background? What what are you up to now and how did you get to that place as a professor and all of the things you're doing currently? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary in Lyle, Illinois. 
and uh, I've been here. This is my eighth year, um, and I've almost already completed all the courses that I'm supposed to teach this year. I have one left. Oh, my gosh. That's, uh... I've taught four summer school courses, and um, I've, been, um, I've been busy writing. Uh, I've had several books come out this year. It just happens to be one of those years where some things came together from odd different schedules. Um, I don't normally work on two books at once ever, hmm. but just so happens that um, they, uh, the publication schedules were overlapping and they all seem to come at the same time. And I'm, um, you may know this, I'm translating the New Testament for InterVarsity to hmm. go along with John Golden Gay's First Testament. Mine will be called the Second Testament. And I'm on Luke chapter 16 right now, but I've done all the Pauline letters. Yeah. And, and I'm also working on a book, uh, finishing a rough draft with my daughter, oh. uh, which we are calling uh, a church called Tov. Tov is the Hebrew word for good mm -hmm. and goodness. And um, it's about forming a church culture of goodness that will not prevent, that will not permit the sorts of things that have happened in Chicagoland at Willow Creek and Harvest Bible Chapel hmm. and um, in the Southern Baptist Church with all the stories of abuse that came out in the Houston Chronicle hmm. and uh, that are characteristic of the Roman Catholic Church and all its lawsuits. So we're working, uh, uh, we're about, about done with a rough draft. It will be I will finish, Lord willing, uh, with the editing of the of the manuscript tomorrow, and then we'll have a rough draft ready. It should be close to the word limit. So, wow, wow. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you about because uh, you write scholarly stuff. That's what we're kind of doing today, and you write popular level. And I know that's kind of a weird way to put it, but this book, um, which I, I don't know that I was aware of. I mean, I know you've had a strong voice in that conversation, uh, having been part of Willow in the past and being proximity to it. Um, uh, is this kind of to a general audience? Is this for pastors? What is, what is this book um, going to be? Well, it's for uh, anyone interested in the stories connected to Harvest Bible Chapel, mm. Willow. And so it's, it's for, it's accessible prose. It's not intense biblical study. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it should be, Available to anybody who's interested in those stories. The cat, some about the Catholic Church, some about the Southern Baptists. Um, I'd like to say more about some of those things, but you only have space for so many stories. So right, right, yeah, no, that's so, hope. You know, I mean, uh, Kurt, what happened to me is that students would come to me and say, uh, it, "It happened in two ways. What can I do so that I don't become like James McDonald at Harvest Bible Chapel?" Mm. And what, what do we need to do so that cultures develop? I started talking about church cultures that develop that don't allow someone like Bill Hybels to become such a power mongering and even abusing type person. Um, yeah. So asking me, so I began, you know, I was saying things in classes. The next thing you know, I'm thinking about it a lot more. And uh, then my daughter hooked me into writing about it. So, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And, it's got to be fun to do that with, uh, with your daughter, but man, yeah. the, uh, yeah, that project, I think it's so relevant. I mean, as a pastor sitting here thinking, how, how do these people fall that, you know, I was telling someone last week about this and thinking to myself, man, of the mega churches in North America, Willow had a theological space that was comfortable for me, at least as it was presented, you know, content from the stage, et cetera, um, compared to others that are, you know, more restrictive about women or whatever. And to see that it's that church of all of them that, uh, ends up going this direction was just heartbreaking beyond, of course, all of the, uh, the real heartbreak, which was what the women, uh, experienced and now the residual of all of that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. uh, uh, the women are, and you're right. The women are the one who experienced it the worst by yeah. far. Yeah, and silence and the uh, bullying and all that was going on, but uh, many of us felt betrayed by what happened. Yeah, and, and so I like to say this is not a. It is a story about some pastors who've fallen, 
Uh, and, you know, 400 and some, 475 stories, whatever it was in the Southern Baptist churches. Um, okay, uh, the pastors fall. But in, in a lot of these churches, there is a culture. Are you still there? No, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. There is a culture that props this up. Yeah. And that's what we're concerned about. Hmm. That's... Um, you know, I mean, there's nothing that you can do in a church that could prevent someone like James McDonald becoming a power mongering person, because that's what he's like. Right. But you can have a church culture that early on recognizes it and stops it for him from being able to do it at that church. Yeah. So in other words, there's a character dimension with the, with the pastors that, um, that can only uh, become what they became over time with cooperation in the culture. Yes. That's, that's what we're concerned about right there. Oh, wow. And I mean, to uh, build a bridge towards reading Romans backwards, I mean, in a lot of ways, um, some of the issues you highlight uh, in that book about privilege and power and um, dynamics um, feel resonant. I mean, different, but definitely resonant. Um, you know, I, I even think of how you start the book with... Um, a woman, you know, you don't, you don't start with, uh, in a way you don't start with Paul, you, you start with Phoebe and this letter carrier. And, um, you know, I, so I'm, I'm really excited. Um, number one for that other book you're working on, we'll hopefully have a conversation about it in the future, but, um, there, there's so much power and prestige slinging all over the Christian church today. And, um, the way you're stepping into Romans and these issues and all of your work is to say, we've got to recognize some of the power gaps and the privileges um, that maybe have been, have gone unnamed. And so, um, Scott, I, I, I guess as we step into this particular book, um, you, you've shared in the past um, through your commentary on Philemon, um, you've shared in other spaces um, that there's a, so, there's a sociological reality that these letters from Paul are inviting us into. And so I'm guessing, or not guessing, I'm curious rather, um, how, how does the weight of that kind of um, bear on you personally as you've come to these passages? Because I can imagine um, having the character of someone who is compassionate, you know, as you've grown in Christ over your years as a professor and church leader. But um, it, it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's been some movement, uh, some awareness in these areas, at least as you've written them down in the last maybe five years or more. Um, what, what do you think's really kind of brought that to some of the forefront of your scholarship? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I think part of it is um, is an increased awareness that began with the Jesus Creed mm -hmm. of centrality of love, mm -hmm. along with, uh, for, me, for me, it was a pretty sudden uh, platforming in churches where I was being asked to speak to audiences that I had not been speaking to. I mean, I, I was a professor and my primary audience was other professors Yeah, and students, of course, but, um, I, I wrote for the, a more academic audience and I wrote the Jesus creed because I, I heard a sermon one day at Willow Creek, by the way, <laughs> uh, ding, by ding, Bill ding. Huntington, in which he talked about Judaism. And I thought, come on, we have, grown way beyond talking about Judaism as a works righteousness religion. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that Sanders wrote his book in 1977 here. It's 2000 and we're still, we're still not learning this in churches. Hmm. So I decided to write a book, um, about Jesus that would be valuable for Christian living, but would also depict a positive understanding of Judaism and, uh, and use Judaism as the, as the enveloping framing uh, of the book. Yeah. So that put me on in churches. And suddenly I was talking to pastors and I was being asked to speak at pastors conferences and my whole audience began to shift. 
And I was offered jobs at seminaries. And I, every time I got these offers, I'd say, you know, that's what I want to do. I guess that's what I want to do. But I don't mm-hmm. want to go there. And uh, that's not it's not the right time, etc. So um, my audience shifted. And in shifting, I was concerned about church culture, church uh, themes that resonated with us today that uh, I had a sensitivity to that I began to see in texts in the New Testament. And when it came to Romans, um, all my most of the years that we went to Willow Creek, uh, we would go on Saturday night services and we would get there 30 minutes before it started and we would sit in our seats and I would open up my Greek New Testament and I read Romans. Um, hmm. I read Romans through a couple times, sitting sitting in those seats. And when I would read Romans, I would uh, I would inevitably begin to think about Romans 14 and 15 about the strong and the weak. And uh, my mind w- was always this: is about context always for me. Yeah, yeah. Is you know this is this is Paul's audience. Hmm. He he knows who these people are. He names all these people in Romans 16. Uh, that's his audience, and He is trying to get uh, this audience to get along. And I kept thinking, if if I if I know this audience with some clarity, which I think we can define with some reasonable clarity. Yeah. If we know this audience with some clarity, what does it do to the rest of the book? And that's where I found I found commentaries good on Romans 14 to 15 and with great nuance and finesse. You know, everything in Romans has been done carefully. Right. I was un, it was shocking to me how little discussion of the strong and weak made an impact on how people talked about Romans one through four or Romans five through eight. It was like Paul was writing abstract theology for abstract people for all time uh, and all places because he was just doing theology. And I thought, no, I want to see what happens to these chapters if we start thinking about them through uh, the weak and the strong of Romans 14 and 15. So yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great catching up. And I mean, it, it really leads to a question that um, really frames the, the style of book you've written. You're, you're literally walking us through Romans backwards. And, um, you know, you, you basically say like, hey, we ought to be starting in Romans 12 through 16 or whatever chunk you kind of go with um, back there and, and, and then go back and read one through eight and sort of see the way that the, um, the uh, audience, as you just said, like connects to those um, things that Paul is espounding in the, the beginning. And I, I guess my question is, how um, if you had someone who said, you know, I want to read Romans like I, I really want to read it. I want to um, do this devotionally, um, you know, my 30 minutes a day or whatever. Are you are you are you at a place where you would say, you know what, start in chapter 12 and circle back to chapter one. I mean, it's kind of like watching a movie, but starting at the last like 20 minutes and then going back and saying, oh, that's why all this is significant. So so. At a practical level, like do you do you think this could actually be helpful for some folks? Um, and um, and yeah, and just kind of talk yeah, about why. Well, I do believe. Okay, I've I've never advised any. No one's come to me and said, "I'm going to read Romans now." Uh, should I read it backwards? Yeah, <laughs> they're not asking. They're not. I mean, I've had pastors say to me, "Do you think I should preach it backwards?" Okay, mm-hmm. now that's a little bit different question because that's a more stu- studied approach, and we preached it backwards in our church. All right. But here's what I would say. Um, in order to understand an author, I'll quote Johann von Goethe I'll, in German. Okay. Willst, willst ein Dichter du verstehen, musst in Dichters Lande gehen. If you want to understand a poet, you have to go to his land. Hmm. All right. So I learned this in college and I don't, I think it was just in a footnote from a book and I really liked it and it was poetic and I wrote it down and I've been teaching it ever since, but I don't, I I think if, I think we can know about the context and it is irresponsible to start to read any book without a little bit of awareness of who the author is and what the author is trying to accomplish. Uh, When I read, I'm reading the novels of Willa Cather right now. 
Hmm. I have uh, an academic biography of Willa Cather sitting next to my bed that I, when I pick up a new novel and I'm reading The Professor's House right now, um, I look at what she has to say about that context. Yeah. Because I figure it'll give me um, some perspective. So I would encourage people, if they're going to read Romans, I would say, why don't you start with Romans 14 and 15 or start with chapters 12 through 16 and read them through carefully and then read Romans 1 through 8 and then 9 through 11. Uh, what to do with 9 through 11? Uh, it's a little bit of a different thing. And yeah. I even thought of doing Romans 12 through 16, 9 through 11, 5 through 8, 1 through 4, actually going totally backwards. But 5 through 8 is the solution to this letter. Hmm. And to have the solution before you get to 1 to 4 is a little bit of a uh, – it was a little bit of a stretch for me. Yeah. My buddy Mike Bird told me I should have. Uh. <laughs> I, I would say – I would say – Yes, try to do that and see what happens. It's not going to be the only time you read Romans. But once you understand the weak and the strong and you begin to ask this question, how would the, and this is the Peter Oaks question, how would the weak have heard Romans 1 through 4? How would the strong have read, heard Romans 1 through 4? Hmm. <clears throat> As, <clears throat> asking the same question over every paragraph was for me, uh, over time, um, a transforming experience of how to read Romans, and suddenly Romans became far more pastoral and ecclesial <clears throat> than the way most people read the book of Romans. <clears throat> and, and therefore, um, Kerry Newman, the editor at Baylor at the time, told me he did not want any footnotes. Yeah. And uh, that was hard for me because I'm an inveterate footnoter, and I like uh, I like to do that sorts of things. But he said, I want you to wipe out every name from the text. Don't tell me. Don't set up a paragraph by saying Kazeman says this and Boltman mm. says this. Don't do that. Um, and he said, the only time I want people's names in the text are when you're quoting them. And don't quote people very much. And I don't want any block quotes. Wow. Well, okay. So he wanted this to be something you could sit down and read front to back hmm. and not get uh, lost in other conversations and get distracted. So uh, the book changed once uh, Carrie got a hold of it. It it um, it loosened up and lightened up. And um, But I I really do think that if we read it back to front, starting with 12 through 16, which is the critical factor, uh, I think it changes what we hear in those earlier chapters, especially. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really impressed me about about the book. I mean, I think, um, you know, there, there's there's a sense that once you know the heart of the actual issue that folks are facing on the ground, yeah, you can kind of inform your reading. And and you use these words. You, you talk about weak and strong. Um, but in one point, you actually step all the way in and say powerful and powerless from the Greek. Um, yeah. And and I, I'd love to hear you just sort of frame for folks because there, there are – multiple views of what weak and strong are, you know, growing up, I think the readings I heard were pretty, um, pretty negative towards people who have conscience, <laughs> you know, the Jewish people or whatever yes. I would have thought. And, and so, um, I don't hear that in, in your reading at all. Um, I hear quite a bit of good nuance there. Um, but talk about powerful, powerless, weak, strong. And then if you feel the bridge is there, Talk to us about our U.S. cultural context and if that connects at all. Well, he says in Romans 15, 1, you know, we, you, he says, who are strong. And the word he uses is dunatoi. Okay. Uh, that, that is a, that should be translated, I think strong. Okay. It's fine. Uh, the powerful. Hmm. That, that connotes something different for most people than the strong. Okay, powerful all of a sudden becomes socio-political, at least in nuance and connotation. Yeah. We who are the, the powerful uh, ought or are to bear the weaknesses of the powerless. 
All right. All of a sudden now we have people who have status. That word powerful in a Roman empire means high status. And powerless means low status. And he's telling people, uh, and this is where I get the word privilege. He's telling people with privilege in their culture to use their privilege for the sake of the disprivileged or the unprivileged or the non-privileged. And yeah. uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you start thinking, whoa, this changes things. And um, the, the people want to say that Paul is one of the strong and he identifies himself with them in this expression, we who are strong. But when Paul uses we, it doesn't always mean I totally agree with you uh, and, and, that, and that people. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, there are senses in which Paul is probably one of the strong theologically, uh, one of the powerful in that uh, they're Gentiles. And, uh, it's more of a Gentile faith. And it's, it's uh, I'm not sure Paul thinks that people have to follow the Torah the way uh, the powerless or the weak would in Rome. But I think the connotation is, uh, and I, at one point, I wanted to press this this point a lot harder, uh, but the nuances of the text don't allow you just to run roughshod over it. Hmm. Uh, I believe that Paul's pretty strong at times against the strong in their arrogance, and he is pushing really hard for the strong to use their positions for the sake of the weak. So... Uh, I think it was Kathy Ahrensperger who mm -hmm. talked about power over, uh, power with, and power for. Definitely, Paul believes that in power for. They have the status, they have the powerful position, but they need to use that for the sake of others. So, Kurt, you and I agree on this. Yeah. We um, as males need to use our privileged positions with power and status without even being questioned um, for the sake of women. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to use our uh, empowered status for the sake of African Americans mm -hmm. and Latin Americans and Asian Americans. Yeah. And, you know, each of us uh, has our own opportunities and our own giftedness and interests. I, I have used my blog and my platforms for the sake of women for a long time. Um, and I will continue to do so. The other day, uh, someone made kind of a snarky remark to me because I was posting about another book about women and men in the Bible by Andrew Bartlett, which I think is a nice rational book. Uh, and he said uh, uh, something like confidentially or, or uh, candidly, he said, I, I want you to know that you're being distinguished for this position, and I wonder if you're doing it too much. In other words, he was saying, I'm, I'm getting to be known as a person who likes to blog for the sake of women, and I wrote back, I'm proud to be distinguished for this topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and today, today I had another post on that book, and I almost started it out, Dear So-and-So. His name was Bobby. I was going to say, <laughs> Dear Bobby, this one's for you, baby. Put him on blast. Just do it. <laughs> That's right. But... Um, I think that's what Paul is saying. He's saying mm. to the strong, the privileged, the powerful of Rome who are in the churches, use your positions of power for the sake. You carry the weaknesses of the weak, of the powerless. I want you to, to use your privilege for their benefit. Mm. And that's a powerful, that right there, uh, Kurt, that goes a long way in a sermon, and it goes a long way for our behaviors for a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a quote written down here from early in the book. You say, ethnicity is at the heart of both the tension in Rome and the gospel message itself. That's like page 19. Mm -hmm. And that uh, absolutely speaks to contemporary issues. Um, and uh, I, as I sit with this and I, I hear this sort of tension, it's interesting to me. So, 
Um, there, there's other approaches to who are the weak and who are the strong. I think of Mark Nanos, right, would say the weak are non-Christian Jews who have maybe returned. And, you know, some of the stuff you talk about, the uh, exile <laughs> under Claudius, and um, some folks will know the background of that. But even in that scenario, um, this ethic that you've really brought to light has absolute relevance. And so I think what's really cool about this particular um, sort of emphasis on um, peacemaking and t table fellowship, uh, essentially, that you bring out in Romans is that some folks may have nuances to how they want to read Romans here or there, but at the heart of the matter is this gospel invitation that says the powerless matter and any power we have should be power for, to use some of the language you just used, or privilege for. And I, that's, yeah, totally. oh, that's, I mean, what a, what a gift, you know, but um, you see that I don't think many people read Romans like that. That's just one example that came to mind. I think my point being that this distinction that you've made about power, power dynamics in the community in Rome. I mean, you go all the way into like houses versus apartments at one point. Right. And, and you talk about like even the spatial privileges. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, yeah, Scott, I was I was thoroughly um, enjoying um, those uh, those parts of the book as well. Um, so so I, I know we're moving towards a conclusion here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, this, this is Romans. Yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> you know, preaching, people get through Romans one to eight and they're so worn out. So I know. So here it's fun to be worn out on Romans 12 to 16. I know it. Isn't that amazing? Um, I mean, yes, worn out is a great word for Romans. But but when you distill it down to its real social implications, it is. We can be worn out on mission with God, you know, modeling the way of Jesus, of cruciformity, which is a term you use often in this book. And I'm curious, maybe as we sort of tie this up with a neat bow for now, um, cruciformity is the invitation for both the strong and the weak that you draw out throughout the book. Can you, first of all, is cruci... Um, and actually, it's not Christoformity. You say Christoformity. And that was actually my question. Is there a difference there? I know like Greg Boyd often says cruciformity and others say cruciformity. Um, and, and beyond that little um, slip of the tongue, I guess, there, um, talk to us about what that means for both of these groups, the strong and the weak. The vision that Paul has of what God is doing in the world with human beings is expressed in Romans 8.29, where... Uh, Paul says that God has preordained or predestined, however you want to translate it, um, us to be conformed to the image of his son. So the goal of God in redemption is to make us like Christ, yeah. Christ's likeness. I call that, I, I label that Christoformity. I didn't invent this term. I've told people, I think I got this in something from Jimmy Dunn, but I... When I look, I've looked, I, I'm not sure where I got it, but I, I, I want to blame it on Jimmy, and I think he will take the blame. Hmm. Uh, but uh, the person who emphasizes this theme the most is Michael Gorman. Right. And, and Gorman calls it cruciformity, but I just read a chapter in his new book, and he has quite a bit there where he talks, uh, where he, again, he talks about cruciformity, but he brings in Christoformity. This is what, uh, this is what I think Gorman is teaching and I agree with him 100%, uh, although I do use a slightly different term. It is about being conformed to Christ as a person, and that's why I like Christoformity. It's a person rather than the event or a wooden cross. Um, but it refers to his life, so bioformity. It refers to his death, cruciformity, to his resurrection, anastasiformity, to his rule. This one I invented um, I don't talk about the rule, the return. I don't know uh, parousia formity. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. But um, and Michael, Michael talks about this. Is uh, Anastasia formity is a key thing. But Paul is willing to keep it a little bit more emphatic on the cross, and the cross becomes a paradigm for Christian living. So crystal formity to me is to be conformed to the Christ of the cross who was raised. The Christian life for the Apostle Paul 
is about becoming Christ-like through God's grace in the power of the Spirit. So that um, how Jesus lived, and Paul likes to take the big picture, and one of Gorman's great books is on uh, Philippians 2, uh, 6 through 11, where we see the revelation of God in Christ, and it is um, not though he was uh, equal with God, but because he was equal with God, he he emptied himself, and that is he surrendered himself for others. So it is inherent to the divine nature for God to to give himself for the sake of others. That's the essence of the Christian life, and that's why Paul, in Romans 12, all the way through Romans 16, I guess, in the tensions that we find in chapters 14 to 15, Paul wants the believers in Rome strong and weak, powerful and uh, uh, powerless to give themselves for the sake of others. Hmm. Both sides surrendering to the other for the, for, in order to create peace in the middle of the empire and to witness to an alternative reality that the Roman Empire is crashing against and uh, uh, they would mock what the Christians are doing but the Christian's lifestyle mocks what the Roman Empire does, and therefore the Christian church becomes a subversion of the Roman Empire. Oh, man, that, that'll that preach, my friend, as you know. That's, that's uh, oh, we need more of that in our churches today, more of that subversion, more of that conformity to Christ. Um, yeah. Oh, my goodness, that's so good, Scott. Hey, I want to thank you for hanging out with us, being on the show yeah. again, and, and for your work. I mean, the, this book is really an important contribution that I know is going to help um, many um, lay people and pastors, and it's a good, important contribution to the overall conversation on Romans. So I'm just really thrilled that uh, we got to talk about it a little bit today. So I hope, uh, yeah, you have a great kind of next stage of writing. It sounds like you've got quite a bit ahead of you and uh, we'll look forward to seeing it. I was talking to my wife when I quit having creative ideas, I got to quit. She said, I think you'll know. (laughs) So, but um, I really, I really appreciate being on with you, Kurt. I think you, uh, you have a nose for Pauline scholarship and how it intersects with the church. And that's what we need more of brother. Oh, amen. Thanks a lot, Scott. I really appreciate that. Good. Hopefully you got something just helpful out of this interview, and hopefully you'll consider getting this book. If you're someone who wants to go into Romans and read it, I definitely recommend this book. I think it's really a helpful resource. There's a few helpful resources that have come along my way that I say, get this if you want to step into Romans. And if you want some diverse ideas, maybe check out someone like, uh, I mentioned him in the interview briefly, like Mark Nanos. He has a different angle, but some of these same dynamics definitely are at work. Um, His work on The Weak and the Strong and his classic book, The Mystery of Romans, is definitely worth checking out. And if you need a starting place, you're like, look, I'm not really into all of these nerdy debates and I just want to go into Romans and know that at least the perspective is well-informed and helpful. I would definitely grab something like N.T. Wright's Romans for Everyone volumes. Those are really helpful. And, you know, if I want to splice hairs with Wright or even Scott or Mark Nanos or anyone, you know, we're going to do that if we're in that scholarly conversation in any way. But at the end of the day, if these resources help point you closer to Jesus, that's really what it's all about. And so hopefully you pick up Scott's book and really, really sit with some of the important themes in there. I think it's going to be helpful for anyone who wants to go a step deeper. With that said, friends, I hope you are having a great week. I don't know if you're commuting right now or if you're jogging on a treadmill or you're doing some other fun activity, but hopefully this podcast has augmented your experience in a positive way. I want to also say thank you to all of those who are um, supporters of mine through Patreon. You can check that out at patreon.com slash Kurt Willems. That's patreon.com slash Kurt Willems. Or you can just go to my website, I think, Theology Curator dot com slash support will get you to the same place all of those things aside hope you have a great rest of your day
And I hope today you will be spurred on to think about God, Jesus, the New Testament. You'll be, you'll be provoked to think about your own formation and journey as a follower of this Jesus, as you seek to become more intelligent and informed in how you talk about your faith, but also to become more and more fully human and alive, just like Jesus is fully human, fully alive, and also God. But you get the idea. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Theology Curator. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out theologycurator.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. If you like what you hear, please leave the show a review. For regular listeners, consider supporting Kurt's online ministry at patreon.com forward slash Kurt Willems. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to explore theology and faith in intelligent and humanizing ways.